I'm Lisa Wingate, and this is the story behind my story. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Lisa Wingate. As we march toward episode 300, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I hope you're enjoying all the shows that we're bringing you. And uh, if you would like to help support the show and keep all of this great content coming, please go over to HankGarner.com. Click on the link to advertise if you would like to advertise your product or services. Uh, if you would just like to donate something to the show, if you enjoy the, uh, the content that you get, uh, there's a link over in the right-hand sidebar uh, where you can drop a tip to the show. Thank you for doing that. Also, we'd like to thank our sponsors who faithfully support the show uh, each week. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, the very best in monthly pulp goodness stories that are strange and, uh, you know, are otherworldly. You can always count on something unique from Tales of the Canyons of the Damned. There's 20 episodes so far. Go pick them up. Uh, Also, thank you to our good friend Terry R. Hill. Uh, he's got two brand new books out. Uh, you might have heard him on a show uh, just the other day. Two Months with Harvey, his new book, uh, all about Hurricane Harvey and his experience with it in his community. Uh, go pick that up because all of the profits from Two Months with Harvey are going to benefit people still struggling to get through the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. Also, his excellent book, Joseph of Bethlehem, uh, one of the most exciting, uh, in-depth looks at one of the most forgotten characters in the Christmas story. So go pick up both of those from Terry R. Hill. I promise uh, you will be happy that you did. Also, thirdscribe.com. If you're an author, you know that you need an author platform to connect with your readers. Readers, if you would like to connect with your favorite authors, they're over at Thirdscribe. It's a vibrant community that Rob McClellan and the good folks there work very hard to build a place where book lovers uh, can connect with one another. Go check them out at thirdscribe.com. Also, if you're looking for a great science fiction uh, read for this holiday season or maybe a gift for someone, uh, go visit my friend Nick Breaker. His new book, Essence, uh, Septima, book one, uh, is one of the best that you'll find also galactic satori chronicles there's two books in that series you will not uh, go wrong picking up some excellent books by my friend nick breaker thank you for supporting our sponsors also uh, at the end of the show we're gonna have an audio book clip like we always do from our friend richard gleaves in the jason crane series thank you for listening Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Lisa Wingate on the show with me today. Her newest book is called Before We Were Yours, and it has been storming the charts and racking up uh, all sorts of praise. And we're really excited to have Lisa on the show today. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. You are so welcome. Uh, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, goodness. My first memory of wanting to, well, I had an older brother who loved to write, so I always kind of was interested in that. But my first real memory of identifying the writer was um, when we had, I had moved to a new first grade class and Teasley, um, Teasley School, Man- Northboro, Massachusetts, and it was indoor recess, and I was kind of too shy to, to ask anybody to play a board game or anything, and um, we had come from down south, so I didn't have any experience with snowy recess days, and um, so I was writing a story, and my teacher came up and started to read that over my shoulder, and um, for years, I couldn't have told you whether she was a young teacher, or an old teacher, or what she looked like, but I could have told you what that moment was like when she stacked up those pages and looked at me over the top and said, you are a wonderful writer. 
And I just thought, I am a wonderful writer. And um, I, I just want, you know, first grade teachers don't lie. I just wanted to be a writer after that. I love that. You know, there there are, are so many stories uh, on the show that uh, of people that, um, I, you know, I, I have this pet theory, and the theory is that uh, that, that storytellers are born and and then writers are made. Um, that that we we kind of have this innate uh, longing and yearning to to tell stories to one another, and and then when you when you recognize that thing and you start working on it and, and working on the craft. Um, you know, then, then you become better and better. Uh, but all along the way in these stories, there, there seem to pop up these people that have just the right thing to say at just the right time, uh, that just ignites a fire, uh, you know, in the writer. So I, I love hearing that you had a first grade teacher that recognized that so early and encouraged you. He did. And it, uh, I, I wasn't even in her class very long. We moved again. We moved a lot when I was little and um, we moved again in just a few months. And, um, but, you know, I always had the report card where she wrote, uh, keep, keep that pencil moving with that great imagination. I'll see your name in a magazine one day. And, you know, I, I still have it. That's the only reason I ever was able to find out, you know, what her name was and get back in touch with her because I, I, I had that report card all those years. Oh, that was going to be my next question is, have you ever gotten in touch with her? What, uh, did did you get in touch with her after you had found some success? I did. I tried really hard when the first book, Tending Roses, came out. So that was um, 2001. And I, tr- I tried through the school and I couldn't get any information. And a few years later, I dedicated my third book to her and um, tried again. And a reporter up there printed a really nice article about how, how I had been inspired by the late Miss Crackheart. And um, then the lady in the bookstore read it, Mrs. Crackheart in Northborough, Massachusetts. Mrs. Crackheart was a regular customer of hers and had taught her daughter 10 years earlier and indeed was not late because she was still a regular customer of the bookstore. Oh my goodness. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So we were connected through this bookstore and the reporter did a new article and with all of us in it. And um, so I had the chance to thank her and, and be in touch with her and um, send her the books for years after that. She was 80 at that time and had taught. So I had had her very early in her career, um, you know, had taught all the years until retirement and had inspired. We um, found a couple other writers she had inspired. I mean, she was just that wonderful teacher who saw, what was special in each kid. How fun. How fun. Um, you mentioned earlier that you were uh, originally from down south and, and, and found yourself in Massachusetts. Uh, where were you originally from? Well, we had lived in Florida before that. Um, I was born in Germany. So um, I'm not German, but, you know, I was born there. And um, so, you know, we had moved around a lot because my father's career was in computers and you know computers were just in their dawning age at that time and so his opportunities carried him all over the place and um so we went too and so i had spent several years the years that i remembered before the first grade in florida and so massachusetts was a big change i bet i bet um i'm i'm always fascinated by how where a person is from uh, influences their writing and and tends to seep in with the kind of the the character of the place and and how a lot of times place becomes a character or at least a kind of a defining influence uh, in a writer's life with with someone who who moved around a lot like you uh, did do you feel like that influenced your writing or uh kind of the the way you approach story at all I think so because um you know, when you do move around a lot, when you're very young, you, I think, have this um, innate desire for what what you're missing that you see in other people. And, you know, we didn't really, for years, have a hometown. You know, we we kind of were here and there. And so I, I see in my writing a lot of um, writing about, you know, small towns and hometown and what it means and how we get that sense of identity from place. And, 
I'm very sensitive uh, to place and there's the feel and the, the vibe of a place. And I like to write about places. I know uh, how they smell and how the people sound and the cadence of the language and um, how the seasons pass and, you know, how the, what the trees are and how the birds sound. And so I, I love I, that to me, I love writing that oozes with that sense of place and, I love writing stories that are rooted in a certain place. Yeah. Um, so you you had this desire from the first grade where this teacher gave you this encouragement, and, and from then on you considered yourself a writer. Did you ever consider doing anything else uh, as a profession? Well, at one time I wanted to be an Olympic gymnast and um, a national finals rodeo star. But uh, my parents would not, uh, well, I couldn't do a backflip on the balance beam. So that ended my gymnastics <laughs> career. Um, I had a mental block against that whole thing. Um, so many of us share that same story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It just didn't, there was no logic to me to coming completely off that thing and landing on it again. Um, and my parents wouldn't finance a rodeo career. So um, they sort of insisted that I go to college and get a practical degree. So I did. I majored in computer science and technical writing, and so I was a technical writer for a few years out of college. And um, but at the same time, you know, was freelancing, and it really just motivated me to get busy and finish a book. I had started a lot of books throughout my life, so all the way from childhood on, and um, getting out and, and going into the work world just reminded me that what I really wanted to do was write on the creative side. And so I, I got busy and finished a book. Yeah. Um, you got a, a degree in computer science and, uh, and, uh, technical writing. Did, were you, did, did computers interest you? Did the, the, the technical aspect of things interest you or, or were, is this kind of from being around dad? Uh, kind of both. Um, you know, that was definitely the, the dawning thing at the time. Um, computers were growing so fast and, you know, new and interesting things were being done with them. And um, I worked for several years for a, a company that was on the forefront of um, architectural drafting software. So it was fascinating to, to because it had never been done before, to see these uh, blueprints, you know, uh, may extruded into 3d models that you could walk through these buildings that didn't exist. And you know, that was, that was high tech stuff at the time. And it was pretty fascinating stuff, but, um, but I didn't really, you know, I, I was more, I was, I was more interested in the user interface end of it and just explaining to people how to use it than I was in the technical end of figuring out how to actually program those things. So I was always a lot better as a technical writer than I was um, on the on the actual technical end of the industry. Right. Um, so you had you had started several books, uh, but did you did you ever finish one before that time, or did you just kind of have uh, a bunch of these uh, kind of great ideas, uh, but just never saw them all the way through? I had a lot of great ideas that I that I wrote for whatever period of time I was passionate about um, the story or the issue, you know, uh, stories for me were always a way to fix things I didn't like in the world. You know, the, the beauty of story is you can take things that frustrate you or that you think are wrong or that you feel should be different and you can just fix them in a story. And so I had a lot of story starts that, that addressed, um, things that, you know, ways I wanted to change the world or whatever, and that never, that sort of ended up in a drawer. And finally, once I was out of college and, and working and things, I just made up my mind I was going to do it. And um, I set myself a, a goal of, of how many pages I was going to write per day. And, you know, I would write I think it was a couple pages each each day in the evening and, and then five each weekend day. And I would get about a chapter done uh, a week. And, you know, I sort of counted up how many weeks if I would keep going, uh, what I would it take before I had a novel done. And so I just did it. I just um, just plugged along one page at a time, which is still pretty much true. <laughs> um, you know, if I, 
I've said this before, but if you had a room of a hundred people and, and you polled that, that room of people, I bet, um, 90 of those 100 people would tell you that they thought they had a book in them. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and I bet that out of that 90, uh, that, that probably 70 or 80 could, could probably give you a pretty compelling first chapter. Or at least, you know, a great story idea could, could really pitch that to you. Uh, but out of that 100 people, maybe one, maybe two people will ever actually finish a book. Um, the, 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 the practice of getting all the way through it to the end, uh, is, is kind of magical sometimes because the, it, for something that, that so, that resonates so deeply with so many people, but so few people actually do it, um, what was that feeling like for you to actually get to the end? And, uh, you know, did that do anything for your confidence as a writer? Oh, it was, it, it's exactly what you said. It was magical. Um, and I was a, a pretty sure that it was, you know, I was a genius and it was the best book ever written because I, you know, I had finished it all the way through and, um, of course it was, and it actually, yeah. And well, um, it, it ended up in a drawer, but it taught me how to finish a book. You know, it taught me um, the process of getting from once upon a time to the end. And you have to learn that process somewhere. You know, sometimes it's with a book that goes somewhere and sometimes it's just your learning book. I always tell people when you, when you finish that first book, um, sit down and write a second one because if that first book goes nowhere, you have your some eggs in another basket. And if that first book sells, you have um, you're ready maybe for a two book contract, you know. But um, don't don't sit around forever editing and re-editing or uh, submitting and resubmitting while you're not writing another story. Right. Uh, so did you sell that first book? No, it ended up in a drawer. <laughs> But I sold the second book. So, um, you know, I just, and by then I had my routine down and I kind of knew what it was going to take and um, knew where the journey was going to end. And so it's not, you're not just hiking a blind trail the second time, you you know where you're going to end up. And, um, you know, it's kind of like when you're driving and you're going somewhere you don't know and it seems like it takes forever to get there because every corner you turn, you're, well, you know, am I there yet? Am I there yet? And then you drive, then when you turn around and go home, it, it's not that far. The journey is much faster. Um, it, it's like that with books. You know, the first one, it's just this blind journey and you're, you just don't have a feel for how much more effort it's going to take to get to the end. And the second time you do it, you, you know, you know what it's going to take, you know, um, you, just, you just have so much of a more and more of a feel for the journey. Right. Um, when you were growing up, and uh, I, I'm assuming you were a book lover, if you love to tell stories, I, I'm assuming you were one of those kids that, that got lost in books. Um, what sort of books did you love? Oh, horse books. I was a horse crazy little girl, and um, I begged my parents for a pony all through my childhood, and that was on my Christmas list. And um I used to imagine when the school bus would turn the corner that there would be a pony tied in the front yard today for me. And so um, I, I, I was every, every horse, I was in the horse book of a month club and one would come every month and the weekly reader, I, you know, I ordered all the horse books. Uh, I think I had read every horse related story ever written as a child. Um, and other other thing, you know, I was sort of an animal lover and a horse lover, and so that that was my reading. And but I read all of Nancy Drew, and I loved mysteries, and you know, I just loved that feeling of of living in another world and sinking into a story. And you know, there's your mind reacts in a different way to reading than it does to television or um, any other form of entertainment. Of course, back then we didn't have so many forms of entertainment. So there wasn't, unless it was Saturday morning and the cartoons were on, there really wasn't that temptation when I was little. Um, so, you know, I mean, we kids went out and made up stories. That's what we did. We played stories in the yard and in the creek and um, played whatever we had seen on TV or read about in books. And 
So we were, the storytelling was what you did to entertain yourself back then. So when you started writing, uh, what, what sorts of stories did you start writing? The, those first couple books that you wrote? Um, the first couple books, well, the very first book I wrote was about our dog. I wrote it when I was five and a half and my brother had taught me to read and write before I started kindergarten. <laughs> and um, so it was the story of a dog named Frisky. And it was, it was um, cleverly illustrated, anatomically correct. Frisky was a boy dog. And um, so, <laughs> so, you know, and it had brilliant lines in it. Like he jumps on the bed, he jumps off the bed. I kind of had to use whatever words I could kind of sound out and spell. Um, but, you know, I stapled it together. It sold very well in the grandparent market. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I just always had that dream. And most of my stories when I was younger were um, – either historical because I, Westerns were big then. So a lot of what we were watching on TV were the big Western series and movies and things. And so, you know, either something historical like that or lots and lots and lots of stories about girls who wanted horses and who, um, unlike me, finally got them. I did finally get a horse, but that was only after uh, my parents told me if I saved up my money, I could buy one. And so I did. But um, so for years, you know, I had to live that dream through writing stories about it. Love it. So so when you uh, got a job and realized that I don't want to work a job, I want to be a writer like I've always done, uh, like I've always believed that I was. What were those stories that you started writing? Um, so I, I just looked at the market and what was, you know, what was out there at that time and what was doing well at that time is, you know, I was, I was sort of, I mean, writers, a lot of writers fall in one camp or the other, either the artistic camp, I'm, you know, I'm going to write what inspires me and I'm, you know, I, I'm going to write the book my heart and that's great. And other writers are totally on the business side. I'm going to write what sells, you know, and I mean, I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm business minded about it and always have been, but I, I can't write something I'm not inspired to write either. And um, so, you know, I was looking at what was out there at the time and my first big mainstream novel, I was looking at, at books like The Notebook and Bridges in Madison County. And you were seeing a growth in kind of that, um, that fiction, middle ground, um, very relationship oriented type fiction. And uh, I was interested in that. I was interested in the the juxtaposition of past and present in those stories. And so my first big mainstream uh, novel was a book called Tending Roses that um, was fiction, but the stories the grandmother told me were my grandmother's real stories. And so it was just about what it's like to be um, at the beginning of, of adult life, you know, the beginning of parenthood and to be around someone who's realizing they're at the end of, all that there at the end of life and the stories that poured out of my grandmother after my son was born, you know, I knew they mattered to me. And that book was an attempt kind of to show the effect those stories had on me, how they changed my way of looking at things and my realization of the life journey and how quickly it goes by. Did you share with your grandmother that you were writing those stories? I did at the time share with her that, um, that I was writing them down by the time I had actually finished the book and it was coming out. Um, she had had dementia and she actually passed away about the time I got the advanced copies of that book. But so she was never able to read it, which might be good because, um, there, you know, my grandmother was a character. She was, she was, a, <laughs> she was a difficult woman. I loved her but she could make you glad to be leaving after a visit to the farm. Um, I had one, I had one of those too. <laughs> oh, so you understand. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. She was just, I mean, she was, she was just a, a battle ax around town. You know, she liked to stir up a wrangle and get in the middle of it. And um, she liked to lecture us about how, how spoiled we were and how easy we had it. We kids who didn't have to walk five miles to school in the snow, dragging five brothers and sisters behind us, you know? And um, 
So, it, so it really, the book was uh, it was about that. It it was about the life and and breadth of that relationship, and um, you know the that difficult yet wonderful relationship with her, and learning from that generation that that comes before. The thing about my grandmother was I never knew why she was such a, a fussy, critical person. And I didn't, I would not have known except for the stories that poured out of her when my son was born and she came to stay with me. And then I understood, you know, every, we're all a result of our experiences. And when you don't know someone's story, it's easy to be resentful of how they are um, or critical of how they are. But when you learn the story, then you understand the person. And, and Lisa, it's so easy to, to view those people as, as two dimensional characters. Um, and, and when you start digging into their story, they really, you, you understand that it's a life lived and, and they were a person like you in a lot of ways. And, and like you said, just a kind of a culmination of those experiences. Um, uh, I had one of my grandmothers was like that and, and she she would 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 cuss at me and my sister uh, for stirring up trouble while she was working on her Sunday school lessons, you know, so, um, <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, just a, uh, a a walking dichotomy and, you know, all this stuff. And, and like you, I'm, I'm kind of the family historian. And, and when I started digging through some of her stuff after she passed away and kind of uncovering the person she was and, and, you know, how the great depression had affect, you know, her family and their farm and all the stuff, you know, a lot of things came into focus uh, for me. So I, I, I could imagine writing that book for you has to be a deeply personal, uh, you know, experience. And, and, and uh, do you, do you still hold that book in, you know, great esteem and, and does it stay close to you? Uh, it does. It does. Um, that, that book, people ask me all the time of the, of the, you know, the published books, um, which is my favorite, which is, and that will always be my favorite, um, it, it, in a sense of, for sentimental reasons. Um, but also cause you know, a lot of, that was a lot of my own journey, um, with my, my first child and, with stepping into that role of motherhood and parenthood and, um, and my family will, will have everybody know it is fiction. We are not as neurotic as family in the book, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, there was a lot of truth in that book for me and it's had a long, a long life. Um, it, it has been in print now for, um, 17 years or something like that. And, traveled around the world. I, I hear from women in you know, India and Israel and Germany and all over the world about that book with these stories. My grandmother, you know, my grandmother was just this little farm wife who um, never traveled a lot, never did anything the world would consider big and significant. But yet her stories of, of farm life and of life lessons and motherhood um, resonate with people all over the world, you know, and I mean, that's the beauty of story. It's so little of it is what you put on the page. And so much of it is what comes with the reader. So, so that was the first book that you sold. Um, yeah, that was the first book that I sold. That was actually not the first one I wrote, but um, right, right. that was, that was not my learning book. That was the next book. Sure, sure. Um, did you did you immediately follow that one up with a with another book? Uh, kind of what was your when, when you sold that one? Um, you know, did you consider yourself okay? I'm a real writer now, and and this is what I'm going to. This is going to be my profession and my career. So that took about um, nine or ten months to sell. So um, I so I did the thing that that I always advise people to do. Uh, I sat down and wrote another book in that time. And so actually when that book sold, it sold on a two book contract to um, back then what was um, Putnam, which is now Penguin Putnam Random House, you know, <laughs> conglomerate. Right. But back then it was, it was Putnam and Sons. And um, it, uh, so both of those books sold and it, it um, and I just went on from there. Um, 
but that's that's one of the reasons I advise people to you know get busy with that second book because as we were going through the the various as I was going through the various struggles of trying to get that first book agented and then you know the agent going through um, a lot of uh, talk with a lot of publishers on it you know some it's, it's such a roller coaster because one day it's you're encouraged and then the next day you're rejected and you know, that, that publishing journey can be so hard. And it's, it really is a comfort to, to have another project winging along there. Um, at the time I was writing that second project, a few, um, that I, I would send it to my agent two or three chapters at a time. And, you know, she was loving it. And so the whole time we were trying to place that first book, you know, I also had my hopes for the second book. So it just helped to cushion the fall when disappointments happened. Right. Um, when you wrote that book, you said that uh, some some notable books uh, in the in the market at the time and in, in, in sort of in that genre were the Notebook and Bridges of Madison County and some of those that had uh, some some pretty big book deals and then uh, you know movie deals that that went off of that uh, was was the market receptive to to your book or. Um, kind of you know was was the market still hot for for that type of thing and uh you know how i think you said it took like nine or ten months to get it sold um kind of what was the market like at the time the market was kind of all over the place and what what really caused us um the most trouble selling that book was that it fell kind of squarely between christian fiction and at the time and um, just regular mainstream fiction. And because, you know, I couldn't have written about my grandmother without writing about church. And uh, I mean, that was my grandmother and she was a, a staunch church going woman and she thought everybody should be, and she would tell you about it, you know, and she didn't appreciate any of the grandkids who weren't regularly going to church. And she made sure you knew that. And I mean, that's just who she was. And so, um, we would get responses from mainstream publishers who would say things like, well, I love it, but, but, you know, there's this, there's this religious stuff in it. And I just, we just, you know, we just don't know what to do with that. And then we would hear from Christian publishers who would say, um, I love it, but there's no evangelical message here. So it's not a fit for us. And so, you know, it sort of fell in this middle ground of just kind of clean fiction, clean just a clean Midwestern type story or whatever. Um, not that there weren't gritty issues in it, but, you know, um, clean in terms of language and um, things. And uh, so anyway, that, that made it hard. People kind of didn't know what to do with it. And finally, um, New American Library, which is part of Putnam, bought it and put it in, actually started, they were... Uh, had kind of kicked around the idea of starting a line of trade paperback women's fiction. And so uh, they bought it and they started a line of women's fiction with it and um, with it and another book they bought later. And uh, that, that was where it ended up. But the talks on that book were all over the place. We had talks to the, the people who had done um, Bridges in Madison County and the notebook. And that and I did a huge rewrite for them. And, you know, we were talking about the, the great big six, mid six figure deal and all that sort of thing. And then it didn't happen. And um, we ended up selling it at Putnam for a, a, a nice deal, but a much smaller deal than that. And it didn't come out in hardcover. It came out in trade paperback. And so, you know, you just, you never know, but um, it was a, it, the, the book rolled along and came out and had wonderful success coming out and um, had some wonderful promotion programs behind it. And we were just, um, just really kicking into that. And on, I was, I was going to go do my, my first big TV appearance for it. And um, we were rushing around that morning in the fall, getting ready to go and, and getting dressed. And so we didn't have the TV on or anything. And um, the producer called us and said, don't come. Uh, a plane has hit the World Trade Center, oh, and we're, we we don't know what's happening, but we've, we're sending all our crews to you know 
to cover it, and so don't come. We're not going to film your segment today, and you might want to turn on your TV. And so, of course, by the time we did, you know, the second plane was hitting, and it was just like the world flipped upside down completely. Um, and so, you know, I mean, you you just you never you never know what's coming, and you can't. The thing about the writing industry is you you can't ever you know, conditions change, things in the world changes, the focus of things changes, you know, nobody cared about books for months after that. Um, You know, rightly so. I mean, we were all, it all kind of felt like the end of the world for a while. And so, you know, you, you, you have to do it because you love it. I mean, yes, it's a business and yes, you want to make the best deals you can, but I think at the heart, you have to be doing it because you feel like, stories can change people and um you know by changing people on the inside it can change the world on the outside because the business end of it will drive you crazy sometimes right and and you know eventually uh people want to hope again and and after those great tragedies you know if there's a book out there that can give someone a little bit of hope um you know i, I think the the resiliency of the human spirit we we all want to be uh, challenged and we all want to have something to hope for again. And, uh, you know, hopefully those, those trends come and go, but, uh, you know, having a book there that's waiting for people, you know, when they need it is, uh, it's gotta be a good thing as well. Oh yeah. I think we need to, you know, one thing that, that, um, like I said before, in a story, you can fix those things you don't like in the world. And we all need to believe that good is going to win over evil. And, the beauty of a story is you can make that happen, you know, and we live it in a story and then we think, okay, well, it's, it's possible in real life. It can happen, you know, that the good people win and that good wins and evil loses. And, you know, so, I mean, yeah, I think stories, um, stories give us a reason to hope and they take on sometimes more relevance. I think um, when, when things are going on in the world that, um, we not only need to escape from, but that we do need to believe in the human spirit. Um, I had uh, I had Rachel Jeffs on the show the other day, and and she's got a, a new memoir that just came out this week, uh, talking about um, her her growing up in in the cult with her dad Warren Jeffs, and it was in the in the news all over the place a few years ago, and mm-hmm. and she talked about that she had someone on the outside that was smuggling in audiobooks to her. And it was listening to, and, and some of them were, were romance books and some of them were just adventure books. Um, you know, some things that, 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 you know, people may kind of brush aside as not, you know, important mm-hmm. or, or whatever. But she said it was, it was those books that told her that people out in the world were good and that, uh, that there was something to hope for and that not everybody was evil and bad. It was just these simple, simple stories of, just humans and relationship and striving for another goal. And she said it was those books that gave her the courage to escape. And that just, I, I, I've been stewing on that all week that, um, you know, you just, you never know about the power of, of story and, and these, these stories that we tell how they're going to eventually trickle down to somebody. And it literally might change the world for them. Yeah, you don't, that, that's the most amazing thing I think is you can, you can write a story and you think it's about one thing because, you know, for you, it is about whatever the topic is. Like I wrote a story some years ago about a, some women who it's a fictional version, but it's based on it. about some women who started a free lunch cafe in a, in a really challenged neighborhood in, in Waco, Texas, just because they wanted to have an effect on the neighborhood. And so they started this, um, this cafe and would feed anyone who came asking and, um, so the story really was about, you know, an ordinary woman who decides to take on this feeding kids in the neighborhood because she sees kids digging in a dumpster. And um, and it was so strange. A woman wrote to me and said, um, I have stage four cancer and I'm, I'm dying. She said, I, I will soon be leaving my 12 year old son behind. And at the time I had a 12 year old son. So it really hit me. And she said, um, your story gives me hope that when he doesn't have me, there will be good people who will see his needs and come to his 
aid and take care of him. And, you know, I just thought, how in the world, you know, does someone in that situation take that from this story? But you just don't know what someone out there reading the story is going to take from it and what it's going to mean to them being in their shoes, reading through their lens of experience at whatever point in life they're at. Right. Man, you just never know. And, uh, but yeah, and there's and sometimes there's no way for us as writers to know that. But we just know that that uh, you know, I, I think I read somewhere that that you um, uh, consider writing a calling, and uh, I, I I like that idea that when when you're given the storytelling gift, um, that you have to sit down and tell stories. It's just uh, it, you know, it's just part of who we are, and uh, uh, yeah, so. Uh, You've gone on to write nearly two dozen books, uh, haven't you? There, you've got a lot of books out now. Yeah, I think about thirty altogether. Oh wow, wow! Um, your newest book is uh, "Before We Were Yours," and it's a New York Times bestseller. It has uh, been getting all sorts of praise all over the place. Tell us a little bit about that story and where it came from. So I never know where a story is going to come from. Um, it's always some little spark, you know, and just a little story someone tells me or something I see on TV or, or what it can be anything. I'm reading the newspaper, I never know. But a lot of times it's some little piece of history that I think is interesting or is kind of unknown. So I was up late one night working on another story. I had the TV uh, playing with the sound turned off because it gets lonely when it's the middle of the night and even the dog has gone to given up on you and gone to bed. Um, but I looked up about two in the morning and there was an episode of Discovery Channel's Deadly Women on. And um, it was an episode called Above the Law. And I thought, what, you know, what is this about? And, uh, and on the screen was this old white house with tall white columns. And in the front room, there were all these baby bassinets lined up full of babies. And I couldn't help it. I turned it on and started to listen. And um, it was the story of Georgia Tan and the Tennessee Children's Home Society. And um, this woman who for almost three decades um, operated this system of orphanages in, in Memphis, Tennessee. And um, because she, the government in Memphis and in Tennessee was very corrupt at the time because she was in with the right people, because she came from a wealthy class of people she was able to um, have ultimate power in the city. And so she made a business of providing sort of made to order children for people who heard it for adoption. And because there were not enough legitimate orphans to be had to fill all the orders, uh, a lot of these kids were stolen from poor families who could not defend themselves and sometimes didn't even know where their children had gone. Wow. So, so hearing that story, what did the gears immediately start turning? The gears kind of immediately started turning. Well, first I just thought, you know, has this been made more salacious for TV? Cause how, how could someone steal thousands of children and nothing is done about it? Um, but I started to research and it really was true. And, you know, then I thought, why have I never heard of this? And so it, it started to spin a story in my head. I started thinking, well, who would, who would tell this story in a novel? And the more I researched it and read survivor accounts of kids who had gone through these horrible boarding houses and orphanages where she warehoused children waiting to ship them out to adoption, um, I just thought the stories of the children were, you know, the, the, their stories need to be told. Theirs are the stories that really haven't been told. You can read the legal documents and you can read people's accounts from, you know, years later, but what was it like to be a child? And just because you're cute, because you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, and you're spotted by somebody in Georgia Tan's network, you are literally plucked up out of your life and dropped into an orphanage, and you don't know why you're there, and you don't know where your parents are, and, you know, you may be separated from siblings. And so I started to hear the voices of these five little 
kids growing up on a shanty boat in the Mississippi River, and particularly the oldest girl, Rill, who's 12 when the story happens. And, you know, it's it's really the story, the historical portion of the story is really the story of what happens um, when they're taken into the Tennessee Children's Home Society and it, it falls to Rill to try to protect and um, keep together her younger siblings, but she can't even in this environment protect herself. Wow. So uh, how long did it take to write this story when you, uh, I, I'm always uh, fascinated when, when an idea drops like that and it's so real and it's so uh, almost burdensome, you know, that you've just got to get the story out. Um, how long did it take to get this uh, book written? Not, not very long. Um, about five or six months. I'm a fairly fast writer when I'm not traveling a lot and I sort of had a chunk of time at home and, um, and it, th- that story came together very naturally. So um, I, the, people have asked me, you know, about the, the names of the people in the book. And it was one of those books when I, you know, I didn't have to get the phone book out and look for names. I mean, they just came with their names. They were so real to me. The, the hardest, the, one of the hardest things to research actually was um, what life was like for the, the people who lived on shanty boats. It was actually a fairly common form of living. Tens of thousands of people lived on, you know, floating shacks, basically, on the rivers during the Depression and beyond. Uh, But the thing is, they didn't write down their stories. So it it was hard uh, researching, you know, what was a shanty boat really like? Where did people sleep? Um, You know, how did they cook? Uh, Just how big were they? Uh, How did you steer it? You know, Um, So that was really one of the harder parts was researching what would life have been like for these kids on this little floating, um, floating boat, this little drift craft in the Mississippi River. But um, it was fascinating, too, to to learn what little I could have, you know, what people did. I mean, lots of them had, um, for instance, their 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 kitchen silverware and dishes were just a mishmash of things they had found along the shore because there were so many riverboat wrecks, you know, and stuff would float up from riverboat wrecks. And so they would have all this um, silverware and China and things they had found here and there that had sifted up out of the sand and, you know, just fascinating things like that about what that life was like. So neat. Um, This book has been everywhere. Um, And uh, like I said earlier, it's a New York times bestseller. Uh, Did you know when you were writing this that this book was going to be so poignant and was going to hit so many people as deeply as it has? You know, I I knew it was a story that should be told, and I knew it was a story a lot of people would care about. Um, And I knew because over 5,000 kids were affected by this that there were going to be out there thousands of, uh, tens of thousands of family members on the birth side who lost children to this and on the adopted side who, you know, have parents and grandparents who were adopted um, kids from the Tennessee Children's Home Society. And so I, I knew that there would be people who would feel deeply about it and whatnot. I, um, there were a lot of, uh, it, I've still been surprised how much it has resonated with people and how, what deep feelings people have about it. Um, in a way, but in another way, I think um, we should have these feelings about it. We should, uh, you know, children are the most vulnerable and helpless of 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 all of us. And you know, we when we find out about situations where they've been exploited, taken advantage of, abused, um, where they have no voices, you know, we should feel really passionate about that. And so, I mean, I hope it it motivates um, people to not only be watchful, because it's not like there aren't still children today who are in um, vulnerable, difficult, dangerous situations. And so I hope it motivates people to be watchful, but also to just be involved, you know, be that, that surrogate grandparent, that friendly neighbor, that person who goes to the school and, and reads, um, read some books during reading time to the kids who need help or, you know, help with homework or whatever. Um, we all, you know, you can't fix the whole world, but you can 
do a lot for somebody's world. That's right. We can we can fix the spot where we live, hopefully, or, or right. try to shine shine a little more light there than than is. Um, uh, it, it's a fantastic book. I, I uh, it's a uh, it's it it hit me very deeply, and um, I, I hope everybody else will will pick up a copy as well. Lisa, what is a a typical writing day for you like? Uh, I don't have a certain set period of time I write, but I have a set number of pages I do in a day. And so that's usually about seven manuscript pages, which is like double spaced pages. So, um, you know, it's sort of a good 2,100 words, something like that. And um, I try really to stick with that because that then I know uh, when a book is going to be done. I can see it clicking along at a certain rate and uh, that works for me. You know, everybody has to figure out what their, what their vibe is for getting a story done, but that works for me. So um, on a good day, I, I get up and get going and get a good chunk done in the morning, stop for lunch, finish up in the afternoon on a bad day. I may still be slugging it out at 11 o'clock at night because, because I don't want to get behind for the day. You know, there's, there's, you have to figure out what's going to motivate you because writing is, is something you do on your own and you have to be self-motivated. And so that motivates me, just the idea of not wanting to start out behind tomorrow. And, uh, and, and you know, different people, uh, sometimes I, uh, these days I have some, some writer friends and we'll, um, we'll arrange parts of the day and do writing sprints for certain hours of the day together and kind of compare how much each of us wrote. And, you know, so, I mean, you, there's different techniques that work for different people, but um, mostly for me, just setting a certain amount that I'm going to do in a day and sticking to it. And, and what a lot of people just starting out don't, uh, don't realize is the, the more successful you become, the more things come into your life uh, that that are all part of the writing business that are not writing, um, like doing podcast interviews and answering email and you know marketing and all of that kind of stuff, and all of that has to be factored into the writing day as well. That is true. That is true. The the farther you go in the business, um, and the more popular your books get, the more you have to figure out how you're going to balance in the business end of it and getting time to write and. Um, it's kind of funny because we all, when we're, when we're starting out, you know, we're just, we just want to sell a book and we just want to see our book on the shelves. And, um, you know, I, I always like to tell people to, to enjoy that time while you're, well, when it's just you and the, and the story, and there are not a whole lot of other voices in there because you don't get that back. You know, the next book, it's you and the story and the editor, you know, it's going to go to and what will Publishers Weekly say and um, what will people say about it on Amazon? And, you know, you never get it. You never get that thing back that you have at the first where it's just you and the story and all of its potential is still ahead of it. Um, so, I mean, there's there's value to that, you know, for everything you you think you want in life that you're not getting right now um there are things you are getting right now that are replacing that are filling that space uh you know for years i wanted that uh, dreamed of having a book uh, go just crazy wild in the market and like this one has and um and this you know this has been so exciting this has been just a wild ride since this book came out and it you know it's sold in 24 countries and it was 16 weeks on the um, New York Times bestseller list and, you know, all those things you dream about. But I think back to the years I was wishing that would happen with books. And I realize now um, as, a, as a parent whose kids are grown and out of the house, and I realize that all the years I didn't get that, what I did get was um, more afternoons when I was home, when my kids bounced off the school bus with their and with their backpacks on their backs and all the afternoons that I, you know, a little boy wanted to, to go down to the pond and fish. And I could say yes to that and put my work aside because things weren't so busy, you know? And so 
it's it's important to realize that that you know yes we want things and and yes we um there are things we think we'd like to have happen but for everything you get you give up something Sage advice, Lisa. Um, if people are, are uh, new to your work, uh, where can they find you online if they want to connect with you and 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 uh, and, and follow along with your journey? Um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and my website, lisawingate.com. So I'm pretty easy to find um, through the website. You can find links to all the, the other social media or like I said, I'm pretty easy to find on there anyway. But um, I definitely social media. I definitely it's one of the developments I enjoy um, that has come along. And there was no social media when I started in the writing business. We barely had email. So um, so this it's a change being able to keep up with people and have this community of people that that you 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 um share life with you kind of do life with but long distance uh lisa thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today oh gosh it was my pleasure thanks for having me thanks for listening to the author stories podcast for more great author interviews like this one go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives there's something there i know you'll love now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. Didn't your dad teach you not to trespass? Yeah. Sorry, I'll go. Joey stepped forward, but Hedwick remained motionless, blocking the only exit. No, 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 no. Someone needs to learn a lesson about respecting other people's property. Joey felt unnerved and panicky. Please. Hedwick, Mr. Van Brunt, please, Mr. Van Brunt, may I go now? Please? Not such a smartass now, are you? His voice grew flat and contemptuous. You little bastards think you run the world, but you have no idea. No idea where your food comes from, what your parents have to go through to put clothes on your back. Humiliating jobs, long hours, going gray, to provide for you. What are you talking about? Life. Real life. You think it's easy, don't you? Don't you? Those stupid adults doing their stupid adult things while you play all day. Well, it's hard. You hear me? It's hard. Joey's breath caught. He knew what Hedwick was capable of. What did you do to Jason? Nothing. Where is he then? Jason's run away from home. I don't believe you. I don't care what you believe. I'm the adult. I ask the questions. What did you do to my son? To Zeph? Is Zeph okay? No. He's not. Zeph is not okay. And it was you wasn't it? You're the one who did it. Who did what? Who twisted his mind. I haven't done anything to Zeph. Don't lie to me! Hedwick raised a hand, and a fireball blossomed there. Joey had never seen Hedwick's gift before. The man held a piece of hell. His face looked like something carved from driftwood, full of cracks and crevices. His eyes were shadowed and vacant, but glittering with flame like knotholes full of fireflies. Yeah, someone's mind had twisted, but not Zeph's. Hedwig's gone batshit. Hedwig passed the fireball from one hand to the other. Did Zeph send you for his things? I know you know where he is. He said... He said he was in love with you. Hedwig made it sound as if Zeph had confessed to murder. Is that true? I don't know. Hedwick broke into a wide grin. Well, we can find out, can't we? He's a pension, right? A pension would know. Know what? You're not making sense. It's their gift. The pension gift. My son's a pension, like his whore of a mother. And pensions are telepaths. 
They always know when the people they love are in danger. Joey's eyes had gone wide. He blinked, trying to process the information. Zeph had a gift? For sure? They have a psychic alarm. If you hurt someone they love, they come running. He raised the fireball. So let's find out. Let's find out if Zeph really loves you. Let's see if he's a fag or not. I know he's not. You'll see. He won't feel a thing when I do it. When you do what? When I burn you black. Joey went cold. Hedwick meant it.